Hey folks, it's Ray with Taste Radio. Right now I'm on a call with Annie Ryu, the founder and CEO of the Jackfruit Company and Jack and Annie's. Annie, how are you? Doing great, Ray. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you so much for joining me today. I'm holding in my hand for folks who are not watching the video, uh, a box of Jack and Annie's Maple Breakfast Jack Sausage. Uh, This is made entirely from plants. It's plant-based jackfruit, water, soy flour, et cetera, et cetera. Um, You know what? This is the product and you you sell uh, several different types of uh, uh, plant-based meat alternatives. But the sausage is something where I'm like, you know, if they get this right, then they're set because it's really hard to make a good plant-based sausage. And you did, you guys nailed it. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, I've been eating loads of them myself. This oh, is there the, it is. You have the patty. Big box from my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, life-saving. Have you ever, I mean, did, did you grow up eating meat? I did, I did. Yeah, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, yeah, vegetarian was a, a foreign concept out there. Um, there. There was a lot of meat, kind of, uh, you know, typical Midwest diet, meat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner sometimes. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's pretty common for the United States and for most of the world as well. Um, trying to change that for sure. When did you stop eating meat? Or, or, or are you completely vegetarian now? I'm completely vegetarian. Yeah, I stopped in college. Uh, college really opened my eyes to the world of alternatives to meat. Um, also going to India where you know, so much of the population is vegetarian and there's so many different varieties of delicious vegetarian food. Um, so both at, at college and in India was, was uh, you know, told that there was so much more to vegetarian than, uh, than just salads. <laughs> which was more so what I, what I thought growing up. Yeah. And you went to school in, uh, in the Boston area. I was about to say in Boston, but Harvard is not in Boston. That's a very, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's something that a lot of people get confused about. It's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we have a lot of plant-based options in terms of, uh, restaurants and availability of plant-based foods in this area. Um, so I assume that was not too much of a hard, not, too difficult to transition to get into uh, that space or get into that lifestyle. Um, when you went to Harvard, it sounds like you had quite the experience, at least academically, you were the valedictorian of your class. Uh, yeah, I couldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to do to be the valedictorian of your class at Harvard? I was really, really ready for a challenge when I went to went to undergrad. I, um, so I was, I took on, you know, a lot of courses, but also a ton of extracurriculars. Um, you know, growing up in a small town, hundred thousand people went to public school. I, I was just immersed in so many opportunities. I just really wanted to make the most of it. And so I offer honestly, my first semester, um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get an A. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get into any of the music ensembles, um, but I was going to give it my best shot. And give it your best shot. You did. Uh, also a violinist from what I read in your LinkedIn profile. I was, yes. <laughs> it's been a little while now, um, but I played throughout college. Um, I'd consider becoming a professional musician at one time. It's very close to my heart. That's interesting because the last time we spoke and, and from, from what I've read about you, uh, it felt like uh, it feels like medicine was uh, the path that you were planning to take in terms of a career. Weren't you pre-med at, uh, at Harvard? I was. Yeah, yeah I was pre-med. Yeah, there was a, you know, a brief time in my upbringing where I had looked to be a professional musician before going back on the medical path, uh, pretty hardcore. Uh my uh, upbringing, you know, was in Rochester, Minnesota, so Mayo Clinic, hometown. Uh, so it's a very unique medical bubble. One third of the whole town is employed by the world's top-rated medical facility. Wow! Uh, and that was very much the path I was on. And when I got to Harvard, I took this class on global health my freshman fall. And learned that, you know, there are millions of people dying every year from things that we have cures for. And that was just, you know, such a far cry from 
everything that I'd been immersed in up until that point, you know, Rochester, uh, very low uh, poverty rates. Uh, you know, Mayo Clinic physicians are tending to the homeless uh, without charge. And, you know, there was a place I volunteered at. It was uh, kind of it's just so safe and protected. Uh, kind of going to the, going to Harvard and learning about global health, I, I really wanted to do everything that I could to help people who don't have access to appropriate health care today get that access. And that was what led me to start the health tech company I started with my brother that took me to India, where I met uh, Jack and Jackfruit. <laughs> you know, Jackfruit is this amazing plant, highest yielding tree crop in the world, drought resistant, thriving all over Southern India, and could transform farmers' lives for the better by being a tremendous amount of added income for them if we could pioneer the supply chains and the foods to be able to get this to market. Um, you know, jackfruit has this amazing meaty nature, just the way it grows. And that's why it has this very special and unique place in this huge plant-based meat arena because it's naturally so similar to meat. So you're not starting with, you know, water and a protein powder, a protein isolate to get to something that has a meaty texture. You're really starting with a plant that grows with a meaty texture. And that enables us to, you know, give consumers foods that are more similar to meat, less processed and more plant, which is really, you know, people are looking for plant-based foods, they're looking to get more plants in their diets. So usually not just looking for, you know, something that's vegan. They're looking really for more plants. And so that's part of what we're really looking to provide to people with Jack and Annie's. Um, but it's also about, you know, providing those foods in a way that's not a sacrifice on taste, because if it's a sacrifice on taste, you're going to eat it, you know, a small fraction of the time as you would eat it if you really, really love that food as food. I think there's, uh, you know, this is, there's so much that's that's brilliant and beautiful about what you're creating and what you have created. The big question I think that a lot of people would have is, well, how do you get people to understand what jackfruit is all about? Because it is still a very esoteric fruit, um, an esoteric plant for so many people. Um, ha is it is it really important to educate people about the fruit as much as it is to educate people about plant-based eating? I mean, I think that for the time that we're in, um, you know, we as a company are, are fortunate uh, because, you know, when I started this company, plant-based meat was not nearly the, the, it didn't nearly have the name recognition. It wasn't nearly like a movement as it is today. It really wasn't even like a, a word when I got started. And so, um, it's now this huge arena, which really gives, um, a foundation and a platform for jackfruit because jackfruit is the meatiest plant out there. There really isn't anything else like it. And so we don't have to do the education about what is plant-based meat and why you should eat it. We can, well, of course, you know, support that, but, um, we can talk about, you know, what Jack and Annie's is and, and what jackfruit is in this space that already exists. Well, yeah, I, you know, plant-based meat was brought to the forefront by, uh, you know, a lot of money, frankly, <laughs> uh, a lot of very well-funded companies that are now, uh, you know, very well-known brands on the market, uh, Impossible Foods, obviously, uh, Beyond Meat. In what you're doing with Jack and Annie's, um, can you sort of, are, do you look at it as sort of following the lead that these brands have created, or is it more, we're doing something that's similar, but better? I guess, how do you keep from like throwing other brands under the bus while it's saying that we offer a superior product? So first of all, we're you know very grateful for all the work that's been done by by brands in this space to to create the space to what it is today to create the awareness um, among consumers about things that they should know about the positive impacts, the environment, um, the ways that you know cutting back on meat consumption is is better for you. Um, 
I think that, you know, for us, it's really about in terms of how we communicate, talking about our point of difference and that, you know, this, this media plant out there is always the number one ingredient and the core of all of our foods. And, and so, you know, for us, like, we like to talk about whole plants as opposed to plant-based because it's not, we're using the plant and it's not, you know, a far cry from the original plant. It's the plant and we're making our foods really with that at the core. And, you know, you're going to add the seasonings and, you know, add in some fat because it wouldn't be a sausage if you didn't have that. Um, but, uh, I think it, for us, it's talking about the food that that makes us so different from everybody else out there. And we don't really have to, you know, talk about what they're not. We just talk about what we are. We already talked about how important it was to you to address um, public health on a, from, from a eating perspective, from a diet perspective, but there might be other ways to do it than creating a company <laughs> as big as, or creating a supply chain for jackfruit. Um, what was your motivation at the, at the outset? Totally. Yeah. I, I just saw this as a company that needed to exist so that we could have a huge positive impact for the world, um, for, uh, you know, consumers health, for farmers livelihoods and for the planet, um, if we could make this happen. And so to me, that was, you know, well, then this needs to happen. And, uh, whatever it's going to take to make it happen will be worth it. And, uh, yeah, I think if I were less idealistic, I would have thought, well, it's, it's too much. It's overwhelming, but, <laughs> um, it certainly has been, a, a tremendous amount of work on, on every front, um, you know, pioneering the supply chain and, you know, we're vertically integrated down to uh, partnering with thousands of farming families in India directly. We have a fully owned subsidiary in India. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and I've been to India 35 times kind of to be able to set all of that up before we had a full-time team based out there. Um, and, you know, the product development, uh, but also building the awareness of jackfruit from, you know, the very, very beginning stages where, you know, uh, going to a top chef, uh, you know, you needed to introduce here, like him or her to jackfruit, going to a top retailer, you needed to introduce uh, the retailer to jackfruit, um, you know, no one from consumers to the leaders of the industry was, you know, very familiar, if familiar at all with this fruit. So, um, you know, as I mentioned to you in the first, uh, couple of years, we were taking a whole jackery with us to every single sales appointment, which of course created a lot of conversations, interesting conversations with airport security, <laughs> bringing this huge green spiky thing in your suitcase. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's been, it has been a labor of love, um, for the vision of what we could do. That's the, the vision is, is the, is the word I was thinking of because the vision is what you're selling. How did you get people to see your vision? How did you get people to believe in this idealistic goal that you had for yourself and for the company and for the world, frankly? You know, there's so many layers to the story. You know, our impact is, is, on these three levels, you know, for consumers' health, for farmers' livelihoods, for the planet. Um, so I think there was always a question of like, and then you're also trying to introduce this crop that no one's ever heard of. Like, how much are you trying to say at once? And what kind of message is going to resonate the most? Because, you know, we as a social enterprise are the impact that we have is tied to our scale. So the more we can sell, the more farmers we can partner with. Um, so we're always looking to grow. So basically what's the message that will, you know, best allow consumers and buyers to understand everything about us. Um, I think, you know, from the beginning, uh, Whole Foods was our first customer. They understood, you know, the, the vision, the mission that we had, and, you know, put us on shelves when I was still running the company, basically out of my dorm. 
uh, <laughs> I remember, you know, getting the, getting the acceptance message sitting in, um, one of the, uh, you know, dining halls at Harvard. So it was, you know, some real, um, leaders and, and visionaries in the industry who, who could see this vision as well and, um, stepped up and put it on shelves. And I think that when you can build those kind of partnerships, uh, that's where the magic happens in the food industry. And you can really start making something change together. Um, because then a consumer sees that, uh, it sees our product on shelves at Whole Foods. And because it's on shelves at Whole Foods, they know, oh, this is the future that's starting to arrive. This is the kind of food that, you know, I've been looking for, looking for less processed, you know, plant-based foods, and now it's here. So, um, I think, you know, finding, finding those customer partners who have similar values, um, is, is a huge part of, of how you get that acceptance over time and how you really get that going. Certainly Whole Foods is, uh, is a, the type of retailer that a lot of brands uh, that have a similar sort of ethos and vision that yours does, you know, that's, that's the place you want to be, that they are always looking for interesting and new brands that are sort of pushing the envelope in terms of um, healthier eating. Yet, um, they do turn down a lot of brands uh, and a lot of brands that probably looked and sounded and felt like yours early on. But how much of you, how much of your, uh, I guess, personality and your education and your interest in this space, uh, were they moved by? I, I guess, was it as much you as it was the vision and the product that they were interested in? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think back then, I would say... I was, uh, you know, less articulate. Uh, I was, I was kind of a nerd, you know? So (laughs) I think I was significantly less, less persuasive. Um, I think that, you know, they really, they really loved the vision, um, and being able to be, you know, partnered in creating the future of food. And I think, you know, um, my background, uh, you know, would, would not really mean anything if it weren't for what we've been able to build, you know, together as a team and as a company and, um, and, you know, with partners who have been, you know, great, great retailers. Um, so I think, I think it was, it was mostly the shared vision of what we could do together, really bring in this amazing plant, uh, to consumers and change the world because of it. How about investors? Um, you recently uh, raised quite a bit of money, um, and, and congratulations on that. Um, early on, you know, just to get a product to market, just to get uh, enough product to supply Whole Foods with uh, with uh, enough product, um, it, it costs a lot of money. Uh, no matter you know what it is, no matter what the product is, um, how did you initially fund the company, and how did you get subsequent investments uh, into the company? Mm-hmm. Yeah, initial funding for the company, um, you know, was business plan competitions from college, um, and then um, you know, family, friends, uh, myself. We're talking like, you know, the very small amounts of money you need to cobble together to like get your first product shipment across the globe, and then. Um, started raising and I also did a Kickstarter like super early on, which was like going around to everybody I know talking about jackfruit and raising, you know, $5,000 in $25 increments. And then, um, I, uh, uh, raised money from angel investors who I sort of networked through my college network and all the people I'd met from doing this Kickstarter. And then, um, you know, started raising from investment firms once we had launched, uh, nationally in retail with the, with our first brand, the Jackery company brand. So the initial brand was called the Jackfruit company. Yes. Yes. Uh, what were your initial products? 
Yeah. So, um, we, so the Jackfruit company is distributed today in you know, 6,000 retail stores. Um, it's in the refrigerated meat alternative category, but you know, the two top items, barbecue jackfruit and Tex-Mex jackfruits is basically, you know, jackfruit that's been cut into pieces, marinated and in, in sauce, um, and, you know, cooked to, uh, you know, the right texture to be able to use in sandwiches and tacos. Now, when it comes to Jack and Annie's, um, the idea for the brand, I assume, is to make it a lot easier for people to understand um, what jackfruit is all about, make it a little bit more palatable in terms of what jackfruit could be or how you could manipulate or use jackfruit for everyday items, everyday foods. Um, that being said, um, the branding that you created is fantastic, in my opinion. It looks very approachable. It looks kind. It looks friendly. It looks age friendly. This could be, you know, for anyone who's a kid to uh, an older adult as well. How did you think about the branding for an item like this? I mean, how do you think about the approachability of uh, jackfruit in terms of educating consumers? Well, the the branding. Um... It was so funny. And, you know, we, we looked at a lot of different concepts and, um, you know, this was the, the only one that really had, you know, this Annie character. Um, and, you know, I, I initially was like, no, we can't, we can't have my name in the brand. That's, that's, that we, we can't do that. And everybody's like, yes, we should do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then I think, you know, the character is, is always kind of, uh, you know, lifting a heavy load to make things happen. Um, you know, so I have like, Annie here is like, you know, pushing the, uh, this huge sandwich into this, you know, the center. That's and, your savory uh, breakfast sandwich that you're holding up. Uh, yeah. which looks delicious. Yes. It's so good. <laughs> and then like, you know, stacking the, the nuggets, uh, together in one place. So I think it was, you know, and we were putting together the brand, um, wanted to really be yes, approachable, and also to just be authentic um, and really bring those two pieces together. So, you know, Jack is Jack Fruit, um, and I'm Annie. Um, but I think, like as you mentioned, with the foods uh, conveying how delicious they are was also part of the approach um, that we have with the packaging. Um, the fact that the, the foods are also, you know, simpler, fewer ingredients. Um, uh, and so having a package that really focuses on, you know, just a, a few things and the most important things, um, was, was part of, part of getting it all right for us. You know, when you're building the jackfruit company, I think, um, it might be easy to think, um, okay, well, we're, we're building a supply chain. You know, this could be a product uh, that we could use in food service, as you mentioned, chefs earlier, uh, introducing jackfruit on that level, sort of trickle down way to get into onto people's plates at home, get into people's refrigerators at home. Um, I mean, when you were thinking about the initial vision, was this part of the long term vision or has it all just kind of happened organically? Yeah, it has. Uh, it has happened organically. Um I still remember, you know, even the conversation when I was at, you know, Harvard Science Center about, you know, changing the company name at the time to the Jackfruit Company. Um, and, you know, we we were, you know, because no one knew what Jackfruit was, we had been really hesitant to use uh, Jackfruit in our name. And um, we were going by fruition at the time. And, uh, which, which people, uh, tended to look at and call fruition, <laughs> which was certainly not the intent. So, um, yeah, it's, it's happened, it's happened organically over time. I think, um, you know, the, the evolution of plant-based meat to what it is today has been, uh, very fast and, and huge, it's just monumental. And I don't think that it was, it was quite predictable that it would happen this way. 
And so, you know, for a company like ours, it's, it's how do you, uh, how do you, you know, grow as, as quickly as you aim to while the landscape is, is also evolving so quickly. So with that, you know, you have to kind of change and evolve your plans with time as well. So while you're running as fast as you can, the industry is changing very, very quickly as well. Um, that sounds like a very challenging, everything about the company sounds really challenging. And it's amazing that you've gotten to this point because the, nothing, I think if, if, if someone looked at the business plan right now, they might be like, wow, I just, even in this, you know, era of plant-based eating, this sounds like an idea that's going to be, that's going to be really, really difficult. And it's going to be really, really tough to make work, whether it be in one year or 10 years, um, racing and running and, and working really, really quickly to achieve, um, what you intended to achieve. You're still not, you're still not even there. I know that there's a much, much bigger goal here for the Jack Free Company and for Jack and Annie's. Um, does that ever discourage you when you are pushing so hard you are running so fast that you aren't getting to where you need to be or you want to be as quickly as you want to? No, um, because all of this was at one point just a vision. And when you can see with the work of our incredible team that every single day we're converting ideas and visions to reality. And when you look back on what we've been able to build and how much easier everything that used to be so hard has become. It's like, we can, we can do whatever we set our minds to. And I think that, you know, going from, you know, raising a hundred thousand dollar, you know, round on a convertible note to raising $23 million, uh, you know, in 2021, it's, uh, you know, investors know that they can believe in us as well, that we've been able to pull off what looked uh, impossible and, uh, you know, create something that is extremely difficult, if not impossible to replicate, that is scalable and that we are in the process of scaling. That's an interesting point that you bring up, uh, that you guys are essentially, you know, the jackfruit company, you know, in so many, I mean, it's not just the name of the, of the company. It is, you guys are the supply lines. You guys are the supply chain for jackfruit. Um, did that, was that a huge factor? Was that a really big, big factor in this recent raise of $23 million? The fact that you guys do essentially own the supply chain. It was definitely, you know, a significant piece of the picture. Um, you know, if we, uh, have a chain tomorrow that's looking to do, you know, 10 million pounds of volume with us on a six month lead time, we can do that. So there isn't anyone else in the, in the country, sorry, not in the country, in the world who could pull that off from a supply chain perspective. So we, and, and there's not a reason for someone else to get set up to do that because we're already positioned to capture that demand. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a solid, you know, position for us to be in as we look forward, having pioneered all of this, it was a huge, huge lift to get here. Um, but at this point in the right place at the right time. The chaos of uh, building uh, a consumer brand and building a food company uh, can come with a lot of, I guess, doubts, I would assume. Well, I'm, I'm not going to assume. I know this because I've spoken with so many entrepreneurs who, who end up doubting themselves and, uh, and you know, wonder if this is going to work. Yet they're always pushed and they're always driven by something. Uh, in your case, you talked about vision. Um, but the last time we chatted, you also spoke about the importance of education, teaching yourself and learning along the way. What have you learned about being an entrepreneur? What have you learned about, uh, persisting, uh, amid, uh, very, very challenging times and a very, very challenging environment for an early stage food brand? I would say that 
I have overall learned so, so much from the people I've surrounded myself with. So I've learned, you know, it's, it's just extremely critical to, um, to bring the right people around you. And that's you know, people on my team, um, that's advisors, that's, you know, board members, investors, that's, you know, advisors who have a consulting role with the company, advisors who are just, you know, personal friends and mentors, um, that has been, you know, so important. And it's, it's not, it's, you know, sometimes it's this idea of like, well, they've done it before once, 10 times. And sometimes it's just uh, having a sounding board because again, you know, having done something in the past, um, our situation is, is very unique. There are not very many companies that have, you know, the types of uh, like all the same types of complexities that we have or all the same opportunities that we have, you know, really looking for people who have a personal investment in what we're doing so that they can be a thought partner um, in regard to what we should do next. You've mentioned your team a number of times. Um, it's, uh, it's one thing to say, surround yourself with great people. Um, it's another thing to, to find those people and recruit them to join your team, whether they be a board member, an advisor, a staff, uh, staff person. Um, how do you find these folks? What are you looking for in terms of their personality, work ethic, experience, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I am looking for you know, experience, but also looking for, you know, personality traits and, you know, somebody is really passionate about what we can build together. Um, because, you know, this is a, it's a very unique opportunity to be working in a company that could double or more every year. Um, that's, uh, comes with, you know, so much excitement, so many challenges. And so, you're looking for somebody who really wants to shoulder all of that, um, good and the bad and who's going to be, um, you know, I think so much of those values of the brand that you see reflected on the package and the tone of voice are also just values for how we work with each other. It's authentic, um, approachable, um, and, and, you know, as simple as possible. So, how do we be direct with each other and, you know, communicate about what we need to communicate about and have a lot of fun while we're doing that. People try to find uh, folks for their team on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn has been a, a great benefit to a lot of folks uh, that I've spoken with um, recently. And then, you know, since, since they've got into the business, um, you know, it's interesting. You're not very active on LinkedIn, surprisingly. Uh, I think that your last post was, I'm seeing it about three years ago. It's when you were hiring. You were hiring an accounting and operations coordinator. I hope you found oh. the right person. Um, <laughs> a lot of times when people are um, in the space that you're in, they do have a megaphone uh, that they'll use and use quite frequently, whether it be on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, what have you. Um, I get the sense that you're not that you're not like that. Um, how do you, I guess, preach the gospel of the Jack Root company and Jack and Annie's in a way that's going to resonate with the industry and move the needle for Jack Root in general? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, expect us to use the megaphone more <laughs> going <Okay. forward. laughs> yeah um i think it's really and you know we've had some conversation about it internally but it's just that you know we we always want to over deliver and so you know we we want to be in a position where you know as i mentioned we can deliver that for that 10 million pound order on the lead time that that customer wants before we're, you know, going out and saying, Hey, like we want your orders. Right. So I think, um, you know, we're, we've been building everything so fast. Um, you know, Jack and Annie's, we just launched, uh, late 2020 during the pandemic. It's now the third largest brand for all of frozen plant-based. Um, but we also, you know, didn't want to be, uh, 
marketing it too loudly if consumers wouldn't be able to find it at their stores. So now we're getting enough national placement that it makes sense to talk a lot more loudly. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, from the perspective of what we're equipped to do as a product development partner with national restaurant chains, what we could do as a supply partner with, you know, the largest jackfruit supply chain in the world. Um, we're going to be marketing more loudly. And that's really uh, just the beginning uh, with this, the press release we did for this capital raise. Are you comfortable leading the charge? Um, you know, you, you've, you've got the, your caricature on the, on the front of every <laughs> package of Jack and Annie's is again, the one I'm holding my hand. Um, is that something you have to learn to be comfortable with? Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with it. I've learned to be comfortable with it. Um, it's not my natural, you know, nature, but I've learned to be comfortable with it. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, uh, it's been so great speaking with you and so great learning about Jack and Annie's and the Jackfruit Company. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. Um, and uh, congratulations on everything that you've created at this point. It sounds like your first 10 years have been uh, pretty remarkable in terms of how you built the company. I imagine the next 10 years are going to be even more remarkable in terms of how you scale. So excited to see uh, this development and excited for you personally. Uh, congratulations again on what you've done. Thank you so much. 